see you here this morning, those who are in person, and we greet those who are tuning in on social media. Trust that this next hour together will be a blessing to each and every one. Just one or two announcements to begin the day. Again, I would begin by asking you to remember our Corps Sergeant Major, Nelson Peters, as he goes through some medical issues and ask that you would keep him in your prayer and that he will be back with us very quickly. Uh, the announcements next Sun, not next Friday, Saturday, Sunday is youth councils. We have eight mm -hmm. folks from the core going to youth councils, which we're really excited about. Mm -hmm. I'll be in prayer for the six young people and the two leaders uh, that they will not only get there and back safely, but that it will be a, a time of impactful spiritual uh, opening in their lives. So pray for them. Following uh, next weekend, the following weekend, October the 31st, is Women's Sunday. I will make no comments about anything else on the 31st. It's just <laughs> Women's Sunday. You no correlation, huh? None. <laughs> and then we're really looking forward to the first full weekend of November, beginning on Friday the 5th through the 7th. Our guests will be uh, Colonels Jewett, and uh, they will be here to lead us in a holiness retreat. They will have details about meeting times, hopefully by next Sunday. That's all being wrapped up with the lead this week. So you'll be able to get all the details, but mark your calendar and I'll walk off Friday through Sunday, the 5th through the 7th, to be with us uh, for that holiness retreat. And then finally, if you think it's a busy weekend, you get a bit of a re re pri uh, reprise because the 7th, Sunday, is the first day of daylight saving. So you're going to get that extra hour of sleep <laughs> in there. Uh, so don't forget, you want to mark your calendars if we fall back on the 11th. Those are the announcements that I have. Pray that God will bless you and use you in the week ahead.
find in retirement that one of my most frequent pastimes is going to doctors. <laughs> uh, I gained weight just by the list of medications and doctors in my wallet. <laughs> That's what I do. And when somebody, uh, when I tell somebody I'm free today, that means that I don't have any doctor's appointments today. <laughs> so that's what we do in retirement. But they're necessary things. Uh, they always check uh, my blood. And I have a cardiologist who checks my heart and a neurologist lately now who checks my mind. Some of you are probably wondering, well, that was a little late. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but here we are, you know. Uh, but today our song also uh, ask some very deep spiritual questions which we need to go back sometimes and have a check on. Mm -hmm. uh, we sometimes get into the thing of church in our Christian walk and we don't check it up and find out maybe we aren't quite what we used to be and maybe we need a visit to the doctor again to check that up. Well, the fifth child of William and Catherine Booth wrote this song, Herbert Booth, and it asks some very deep questions. It says, before thy face, dear Lord, myself I want to see. It kind of reminds me of Isaiah, doesn't it? You know, when he stood there in the presence of the holy God and he fell down under that holy gaze, you know, and says, well, it's me, I am undone. While I, every question sing, I want to answer thee. And the course gets into the deep of it. It says, while I speak to thee, Lord, thy goodness show. Am I what I ought to be? O Savior, let me know. No matter how long we've been in the experience, we sometimes have to ask the question, don't we? Yes. Well, we're going to sing the uh, first, second, Verses, but I also want to say, you know, just coming on the third and fourth, since we won't sing those, but it says, Have I a truthful heart? The spiritual cardiologist, the conscience key to feel, and the spiritual neurologist. The baseness of the false excuse, the touch of all unreal. Have I the zeal I had? I remember those days when I first came out and I was going to win the world for Jesus, you know. By the zeal I had when thou didst me ordain to preach thy word and seek the loss. But do I feel a pain? This is a little inconvenience, a little difficult these days. Finally, the fifth verse, which we will sing, O Lord, if I am wrong, I will not grieve thee more by doubting thy great love and power to make and keep me pure. Verses 1, 2, and 5. Oh.
bless the band to drop out and sing with us on this time. Just the chorus, one more time, just the piano, sing with you. Why see anything that we're bringing. We don't want to see uh, all of our, uh, any of our good works that even the best of those you said are just as good as trash apart from you. We want to see you in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, working through our hands, speaking with our voices. We want the world to see you. The Lord, sometimes our humanity gets in the way. Sometimes we doubt you. Sometimes we don't understand. Sometimes we get a little selfish. As a result, we don't always follow you. And so it's imperative that we have these moments when we stop and we listen and we rest in your presence and allow your Holy Spirit to reveal those things that do not honor you. Father, we give all of that up today, at this moment, right now. We want to be so wrapped up in you that, again, the world only sees you, not us. And that we serve with your, with your love. That we reach out into the world with your compassion. That we speak your word. Father, we, we love you. We are grateful for this opportunity to gather together, to draw strength from one another, but most importantly, to draw power from the Holy Spirit to face the days that are coming. We need this time to reset. We need this time to refresh. We need this time to renew our strength and to sally forth into this world and to take on the challenges that we face. So Father, give us a good day in your house. We know you are present with us. May make us aware of your presence. And may we leave this place different, better, and how we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am excited, really, because this is the first time in several years that my brother and his <laughs> lovely wife have been able to uh, be with us, uh, just visiting, and as well as being with us on a Sunday morning. And uh, many of you already know, but for those of you that don't, uh, my brother, Major Mark Carwell, uh, uh, is with us. Um, and then there's his, again, his lovely wife who uh, brings class and civilization to the to the family uh, uh, Jan, major jan harwell they are currently stationed at territorial headquarters um right for that. but we are i was going to leave that alone okay. i'm trying to be positive today anyway we are glad to have him with us it's always fun and we always laugh and we 
always look forward to those these times of, of, uh, of fellowship, of catching up, of telling stories, and uh, and just having a good time. And so I've asked uh, Major Jan if she will lead us in our scripture reading this morning. It is a joy to be with you this morning. We love your officers. <laughs> and we don't say, I don't say that just because they're family. We really do love Hank and Eunice, and we know you do as well. Our scripture this morning is taken from Colossians, the third chapter. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, <coughs> then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May our lives reflect the new creations we are in Christ. Yes, Lord. Good morning again. It is wonderful to be with you. And just thinking about the, the different ways God uses others to encourage us, to shape us, and uh, of course, family is a big part of that. And it's great to be here with Hank and Eunice, but also some of you who have influenced us and me in particular. So blessed to have session, a session mate here with us mm -hmm. and to share together officers who we served with in Texas and just have um, just been such a blessing to us uh, over the years and others of you who have been uh, set a great standard for us and a model for us and have encouraged us uh, and myself in, uh, in our journey of service to the Lord. And so we're so grateful to be with you uh, and uh, it's a joy. Uh, today's worship has already been so rich, hasn't it? We've got another wonderful song. I didn't know a lot about Brigadier Ruth Fanny Tracy, so I did uh, uh, look her up and, uh, well, she's with the Lord, I wasn't able to connect with her, but, but looked up her story, and uh, it really is a fascinating story. I won't give it to you today, but she did author uh, some hundred, uh, over a hundred songs, uh, and was there in the early days of the army, uh, and uh, was editor, I think, more
a particular note, she was the editor of the Deliverer publication for the Army for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And this is just, an, again, another beautiful song, a song of earnest pleading, yearning to experience all that Christ desires to do in and through us. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful prayer. We're going to sing all three verses that the band can <laughs> can hang with us, that'd be great. And I'll invite you to stand and just, uh, again, uh, this was her prayer, and uh, make it your own this morning as we sing all three verses. I think the tune will be familiar. Okay. <laughs>
Is this on? Yeah, it is. Okay. So, good morning. Good morning. Um, what's happening in a couple of weeks? Everybody? Halloween. Halloween. Winter Sunday. Well, there's that too. One in Sunday. Women's Sunday, of course, it's Women's Sunday. But it's also Halloween. <laughs> of which we are not going to make any comparisons, not are we? No. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to show, you know, kind of show off a little bit. I kind of made this one a little bit myself and picked up a few, you know, a few things here and there from different places. Unfortunately, um, I didn't get the size quite right here. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about that either. But it's always been a, a kind of a, a fun experience. And it's just right around the corner from us. And uh, one of the more treasured activities of kids is. What? Dressing up in costumes and going around extorting candy from the neighbors. <laughs> and believe it or not, I was not immune uh, to wearing a costume and going trick-or-treating as a child. And I think I have evidence of that. Yep, there it is. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yep. There's my brother, there's me, and, and guess what? My wife was not, you know, uh, uh, exempt from it either. either. <laughs> we all did it. Right, as uh, many, many of us as kids, and I don't want to get into a discussion as to whether or not Halloween is is good or bad or whatever. It just right now we're going to talk about the fact that it just is. At least our parents are. We're not trying to make a make a joke about it like this one did. You probably can't see the, the caption on there, but that poor little girl wanted to be a transformer for Christmas uh, for, for Halloween. Yeah. Yep, yep. She wanted to be a transformer, and guess what? Her dad did. Awesome. They just, they just don't do that. Now I'm going to tell you though. Like I said, we're not going to talk about whether or not Halloween is good or bad or whatever. It, we're just going to talk. We're just going to accept, accept the fact that it's a reality in our world. And uh, the National Retail Federation is predicting that spending is going to reach uh, Halloween spending is going to reach ten point one four billion dollars this year. Ten billion dollars are going to be spent on Halloween in this country this year. And they're basing that number off of data collected by a survey that they do every year. And that the results show that shoppers plan to spend on average a little over a hundred bucks on each person for Halloween just this year. Families with children are, expect, are estimated to, to spend closer to hundred and fifty dollars because you know Costumes, right? Candy, all that fun stuff. In our own neighborhood, I've driven by places and we've seen people decorated their front lawns for Halloween. And it seems that people are making plans to celebrate Halloween on a level that is comparable to what they did before the pandemic hit. So think about that for a minute. We're, there's some people that are just a desire to get back and do what we have always done um, because that just feels comfortable and normal. And just out of that 10 billion that uh, or 100, yeah, that 10 billion that we that, that we talked about, earlier, an estimated three billion is going to be spent on, just on the costumes. Three billion dollars. Now the top 10 most Google Halloween costume ideas. See how many of you? I'll let you, I'll let you think about that for a minute and just see uh, how many you can come up with. But let, I'll tell you what the top 10 are. The first one was a witch. Okay, rabbit. My brother was ahead of the curve. Dressed up like a rabbit for Halloween. Uh, a dinosaur. Uh, Spider-Man. Cruella de Vil, who is the villain from the 101 Dalmatians. Uh, I don't understand the real, the real desire to make the protagonist of some movies now the, the villains. I don't, I'm not interested in their story. Don't care. They were the bad guys. They need to go away. <laughs> Going on, the number six most Googled costume idea was a fairy, a Harley Quinn, a cowboy, clown, and Chucky. And unfortunately, they are rebooting the Chucky franchise. And like, awesome. Okay, that's gonna be fun. Uh, anyway, I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, not just about kids in costumes, but you know there's adults who love to wear costumes too. There's a, a, 
a thing that people call, that's out there called cosplay. It's a hobby. And uh, cosplay is really just a, a made up word that puts together the word costume and play. Cosplay. People get excited about wearing a costume. These folks aren't here, costumers for Christ, by the way. They will make their costumes like this, and then they go to visit kids in hospitals. I mean, that's one of the things that they do. And, and, they, and they have a ministry um, with their costumes. Um, but just in general, cosplayers, uh, uh, the, uh, well, let me find where I was here. It's, uh, basically, it's just, the idea is they, they pick a favorite character or a setting in a science fiction or or popular culture, and they'll make the costume that fits that. Uh, there was a survey that was conducted by Cosplay Calamity in March of 2017 that says that the makers of these costumes um, have you know have uh, report different habits here. According to the survey, the majority of cosplayers spend only about a hundred to two hundred dollars per costume. Um, but 70% of cosplayers spend an average of 100, over 100 to 600 dollars on a costume that they make, and they make these. Um, there's another, again, the same survey as well as an article in Time Magazine. Some more advanced cosplayers report that they'll spend over a thousand dollars on a single costume. Okay, and they just it's their hobby. Some people go fishing. Some people go golfing. Some people dress like, like dress up like Superman. Okay, um, and depending on the character, some costumes can be as inexpensive as a trip to your local thrift store. Uh, matter of fact, there was a really nice uh, video on the Ministry Toolkit uh, that was done by the, I guess the Army in the Carolinas, where somebody said, "Okay, I have some um, ideas for a costume," and so they would go. They went down to the thrift store and found things that were able. To, they were able to put together a simple costume. Based on stuff they picked up out of a store. What motivates people to do this though? What I mean, again, we get sometimes we get hobbies like fishing and golfing and stamp collecting. What motivates people to do this? I don't know if you remember this lady or not, Barbara Adams, but back in 1996, uh, she made headlines when she wore a uniform based on the, the costumes from the Star Trek The Next Generation TV series. She wore that uniform to the Whitewater Trials in, you know, uh, in, Ar in Arkansas back in 96. Um, and made a big, and people were, you know, she stood out in the crowd and people were, were interested in her story. And uh, when she was asked, why did she wear that uniform? She says, well, I always wear my uniform on formal occasions. <laughs> now, it's interesting that she recognized the seriousness. I mean, this was a formal occasion, right? Um, and I don't believe that she was trying to mock the proceedings, but I think she incorporated something that, that she found deeply personal and, uh, and something that she loved very much and was not, not ashamed to make it public. And no one in the courtroom really ever objected to her dress. They never had a problem with it. Now, a year after this, in 1997, uh, the 501st Legion was established. Now, you probably said, 501st Legion? Well, the 501st Legion, in its own words, is the leading force in fan-based charity events and is truly dedicated to brightening the lives of those less fortunate. But it's best known as the organization of Star Wars Stormtrooper cosplayers. Members create all their costumes themselves. They cannot go to a store and buy that. The reason for that is they don't want to infringe on the intellectual property of Lucasfilm, the, the, the folks who produce the movies. They make all their own stuff. Um, for a number of years, I participated, and I told you about this, the uh, Historical Reenactment Club known as the Society for Creative Anachronism, the SCA. And this group researches the Middle Ages and is known for holding events where attendees dress in garb or historical costume, and they have uh, mock uh, tournaments, um, but there are other groups um, that also will focus on costumes and period dress of the American Civil War or the American Revolution. Um, in a blog post from December of 2012, Molly McIsaac wrote about the various reasons that people give when they say they, they, they love cosplay. 
And in short, it really boils down to two main reasons, identification and community. I'm gonna pause right here for a moment. And I want you to really think about what she's saying here. Identification and community. Especially in light of the scripture that we read earlier. See, identification is a factor in that the cosplayer is seeking to emulate a particular character. Uh, ideally, the person cosplaying one of these characters has identified a quality or a trait that they would rap like to replicate in their lives. They want, they like, they say, I really look up to Superman. I want to be like him. I want to dress like him so that I can be more like him. The other reason that people give is for community. They want to belong to something bigger than they are. And there's that sense that the more, the merrier, the more, the stronger. A few years ago, I went to a convention where a garrison of the 501st Legion were present. There were lots of, of variations on the stormtrooper outfits, the fighter pilots, the snow troopers, and so on. Uh, but they were all identified and, and, and part of the same community. And again, identification plays a large part in that. But rather than identifying with, a, with an individual, character, these cosplayers are focusing on the goals and values of the group. They, they believe, and especially with the 501st, who, again, they're, they're all about charity. They dress up and they go, they'll go to hospitals. They'll do uh, charity events. Um, they have even been known, some uh, chapters, to actually ring the bell for the Salvation Army at Christmas in Kevin. Now, I gotta confess to you, I would love for them to do that again. <laughs> That would be so much fun. I don't know that I can get, I can swing that or not, but I've tried in a couple of other places. I just haven't been able, made, been able to make it work. But the cosplayers here, again, they're focusing on the goals, the values of the group, and, they, and they're wanting to find like-minded people to participate in their fandom together. They want to they be part of something. Now you notice, I'm wearing a variation of a historical Salvation Army uniform. That's not exactly right. I, you know, I've had to piece it together here and there, but it's close enough. You know what I was trying to do. The Salvation Army can also be accused of wearing a costume of sorts. Now, bear with me. Don't hear what I'm not saying. Um, the uniform performs a lot of the same functions that a cosplayer's garb does in that it identifies us as part of a group. We are part of the Salvation Army. When we, when, when we wear our uniform, people know, hey, there's something. You know, there's something different. There's something that's standing out. Um, I remember when I was in college, I worked for the Office of Media Ministries, which was a television production unit in, in Dallas. And uh, while I was there, they produced a, a, a video, basically a training series of videos for the home. And we had hired some actresses to play the parts of the core officer and the uh, and the uh, 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 holding members, right? And uh, I think they were trying to stay away from actual Salvation Army people because they didn't want either. There was a couple of reasons: either they weren't good at, at acting, or which is probably a good thing. They're not they're not good at acting. You, you want them to be real, right? Um, or the second reason is because. Uh, um, we didn't want somebody to say, oh, hey, I recognize that person and then forget and miss the whole message. So we hired these actresses. And one of the actresses got sick, really, I mean, really, sick. she got pneumonia and was, had to be hospitalized. The actress playing the core officer decided to go visit her at the hospital on her lunch break. Rather than taking the time to change out of her uniform, her costume, to go, she just went as she was. While she was walking the halls of Parkland Hospital in, da in, in downtown Dallas, um, somebody stopped her and said, Captain, I, I really need you to pray with me. Didn't know who she was. She is not a Salvation Army officer. She was wearing, in her mind, a costume, and somebody still recognized that uniform and said, I need you to pray with me. Mm -hmm. That woman came out of that, that experience profoundly impacted by the power of the Salvation Army uniform. Um, I know a lot of times it's probably not fashionable, it's not fun, 
it kind of stands us out. Sometimes maybe people don't, you know, don't feel, they get, uh, they feel uncomfortable, but man, understand the world recognizes that uniform. Maybe not all the time, but enough that it makes a difference. So whenever you wear a uniform, man, be proud. Be proud of that. But again, we are identifying ourselves with this organization that for over 100 and what, almost 60 years now, we have stood for God's love for the world and, and his, and his uh, salvation that he offers us. And this all got me thinking, what do, who do we really identify with and who are we wearing? I don't know if you've ever watched any of the uh, any of the uh, award shows and they have a red carpet and everybody, all the stars come out, they walk the red carpet and, and the, uh, the reporters on the sideline, what do they, what do they always say? Who are you wearing? Like what designer made your outfit? Who are you wearing? And I've always thought, what a great question for believers. Who are you wearing? There's a lot of well-meaning believers, and maybe a few that aren't so sharp, um, who are concerned about people who spend so much time and energy um, in their in their hobby, in their in their co in cosplay. But what they forget about it, it, forget it. It's not about what someone is wearing. If we read in uh, 1 Samuel 16, um, and I think I think that goes out of order here, but we look at First uh, First Samuel 16, and even Matthew 15, 17 through 20. It's not about what we look like on the outside, but what's going on inside. It's not about what you're wearing, but who you're wearing. The Apostle Paul teaches in his letter to the Colossian church that the old life that believers have left was full of evil things. There's a lot of bad stuff in this world. Uh, like sexual sinning, like doing evil, like letting evil thoughts control us, like wanting things that are not right, like greed. He further indicates that this is really serving a false god, or perhaps wearing the garments of the enemy, as we read in Colossians 3, 5, um, from the New Century Version. What he's saying is that we should stop looking to serve our internal selfish desires, what make the things that we want over and above what's right and good and, 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 and holy. Instead, focus on serving Jesus and others in his name. Paul then writes to the Roman church. He tells them, as we read in chapter 13, verse 14, that we need to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Forget about satisfying your sinful self. Again, from the New Century Version. What Paul is saying is that our pursuit of Christ's likeness is as if we wear his garment. Now, by, by this, I don't mean that there's a dress code. Well, Salvation Army, we have our own dress code, sure. But that's not, the, that's not what I'm talking about here. I think we need to be known by how we live our lives. Elsewhere, we are encouraged um, to... Uh, have the same mentality, the same attitude of, of Jesus by placing the needs of others ahead of our own, by living in humble obedience to God. And this is the example that Jesus gave for us to model. This is the thing that he asked us and said, do this, do what I'm doing here. And he wants us to wear it as if it were a fine suit of clothes. Now, we could always wear on the outside a t-shirt and, and short pants, Maybe even a jumpsuit. Maybe even a kilt. Not sure I would get away with that, but okay. Um, but Or even that Salvation Army uniform that we've talked about. The actual fabrics and designs don't matter, only the character of our lives. And this also fulfills the two main reasons why people do cosplay. Identification and community. We are identifying ourselves as belonging to Jesus. We are identifying ourselves as having received his salvation. We are identifying ourselves as people who could not save ourselves and we needed Jesus. So there's that identification with him. And then there's that community of, of gathering together with others, of believers who have experienced the same thing and want to share it with the whole world. 
main difference is that most of the time, at least, cosplay is temporary. At some point, you're going to take it off. Cosplayers dress up like their favorite character or someone from their favorite franchise for a short time, and then they take it off and go back to their everyday lives. Nothing really changes. But the Christian is to be clothed in Christ permanently. Every single day, Jesus' life and needs to be on display in the believer. The world's got to see him in us. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, dearly beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience, and bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all. Not some. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If we're really going to experience any growth whatsoever, with regard to our spiritual lives, we've got to discard the old, worn-out rags of the lives we used to live before Jesus. Lives that were marked by the, by garments of anger and bad temper, doing or saying things to hurt others, using evil words when we talk, lying about lying to and about one another. Instead, we need to put on His clothes of compassion of kindness, of humility, of gentleness and patience. We need to identify with Jesus in his character and in his love for the world that he created. We need to identify with his values and mission. And we need to become a community of like-minded individuals following his lead, supporting one another. And this is going to require a radical transformation of our minds and of our hearts to lead us away from our selfish motives. We can't do it on our own. If we try to do it on our own, we're just putting on a costume. We've got to be transformed. We've got to be changed by him. As we probably know, that kind of transformation just, again, doesn't happen on us. On our own, or by ourselves, by the sheer force of our will. Because I believe, I firmly believe, that if we could have saved ourselves, we would have done so by now. We'd have plenty of time to figure it out. We cannot do it on our own. The only way to be clothed with the characteristics of Jesus' life, the only way to, 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 to reveal him to the world through us, is to be changed by his Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that that can happen today. You don't have to wait until you've uh, gotten a new, set of, uh, a new set of clothes to wear. You don't have to wait until you, you know, clean up a little bit here and there. You don't have to wait until, um, you know, the first of the month. Um, you don't have to wait till your birthday. You can do it today. Jesus can change you right here, right now. He can help you put on these clothes of compassion and kindness and gentleness and peace. Uh, clothes that, that mark us as his people. And all it takes on your part, really, is just as we uh, prepare for our, 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 our time of prayer together, just uh, getting up from where you're at. 
coming to this place of prayer. Again, if you can't, you know, you, you can stand and someone will pray with you. That's fine. But we invite you to come and, and just allow him to take the old garments that you used to wear and change them out for his. We're going to sing uh, that chorus that's listed up we'll be putting on the screen here. Um, but let the beauty of Jesus be seen. And that's really what prayer is, isn't it? We want the world to see Jesus in us, through us. We want him to hear, we want the world to hear him through us. We want the world to witness his love acted out through our hands. And so as we uh, sing together this course, we give that opportunity to come to this place of prayer to exchange the, the garments that you used to wear for something new. And then, hear the challenge. Because when we leave this place, we're going to face a world that is not in favor of, of, uh, of Jesus. And so I'm going to invite you to see that. And that, uh, once, once we conclude, let's sing together that chorus. <laughs> Thank 
one person or less, I'm going to invite you to stand. And uh, again, as, as part of my uh, challenge to you, suit up this week. It's going to be great. First, we're going to sing one verse of Psalm number 591 in the chorus, and then we'll have our, uh, our United Benediction.